Right, so hello everybody. Um, I hope I hope you're all safe and well in these um, in these strange times. But welcome to everybody to um, to the Science Breaks event. Um, I just wanted to highlight to everyone that um, this uh, uh, event is being uh, live recorded, just so you, that you know. Um, so I'm Dr. Richard Gill from Imperial College, sitting here in my in my living room um, presenting to you um, and I'm just very very happy that as many of you can can join us as possible um, as this part of this science break uh, event and so this event is a, a virtual series that showcases some of the the leading research that we're doing here at Imperial College uh, particularly some of the research that we're doing to try and address some of the the big questions and the grand challenges um, across the globe and across the world. So for this particular episode of the Science Breaks, we're going to be touching on what uh, we think is arguably one of the biggest grand challenges, and that's agricultural sustainability and also food security, so feeding the, the 9 billion across the globe. So here we're going to focus on why we should be concentrating on some of the really very small organisms living both in and around um, these agricultural ecosystems. Um, and so what we've called um, looking and, and understanding and highlighting the importance of the unseen and often unsung heroes of biodiversity. And so to do this, we want to highlight some of the work that we've we've looked at that have both um, uh, revealed the importance of these organisms but also highlighted some of the threats that they have to face. So we're showcasing some research that three Imperial College researchers, that would be Bonnie Waring, myself Richard Gill and Peter. So Dr Bonnie Waring, she's a senior lecturer at the Grantham Institute um, on climate change and the environment. Um, she's particularly interested in the carbon cycle and her work studies how plant and microbial ecology influences the movement of carbon among plant soils and the atmosphere. And it'll be actually Bonnie that's presenting this presentation today, but she'll also include some work by Dr. Peter Greystock. So he's a research fellow in the Department of Life Sciences at Imperial College, and his research focuses on the transmission uh, and effects of both the harmful but also beneficial microbes of bees and also the implications that this can have in the understanding of how to manage the key pollination services that bees provide. And then there's also going to be work uh, by myself. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Life Sciences um, and I'm particularly interested in how changes to the environment are threatening insect pollinators but also understanding how things like land use change, climate change, and also agricultural practices are affecting their pollination services. So without further ado, I'll, I'll pass you over to, to Bonnie, who's going to give you uh, the presentation. Um, during her presentation, you can uh, raise questions um, as well as afterwards on the Q&A chat on the panel on the right hand side of your screen. Um, and just to uh, also say that you can leave those with your name, but you can also leave them anonymously if you wish. So I'll um, pass over to Bonnie now and you can take it away. All right, thank you so much. Well, as Dr. Gill said, what I'll be discussing today is how our food security really hinges upon biodiversity, particularly the biodiversity of organisms that we may not spend very much time thinking about. And I'd like to open by talking about the huge challenge, challenge that's facing agriculture today namely the need to feed a rapidly growing population. So this graph here in green is showing the growth of world population from the start of the Industrial Revolution in the year 1700 to the present. And the pink line is tracing the rate of population growth each year. So you can see that beginning in the 20th century, there was a massive explosion in the size of the human population. And even though that rate has now declined, we still expect that our population will grow to about 11 billion people by the end of this century. And that many people face, uh, puts tremendous pressure on our planet's resources in order to produce enough food. And one way to think about this is to visualize the amount of our planet's surface that we use for food production. 
So only about 30% of the planet's surface is land, the remainder is ocean. Of that land surface, just about 70% is habitable. The rest is covered by glaciers or is completely barren. Of that habitable land, fully half is devoted to agriculture. Most of that is actually used for livestock, meat and dairy, about 77% of the agricultural land, and the remainder to crops, uh, predominantly wheat, rice, and corn, from which the world derives 80% of its calories. Another way of visualizing the same information is to look at the growth in the area of lands devoted to agriculture from the year 100 to present. So you can see that coinciding with the growth of the human population, there's also been an explosion of land use conversion to crops and pastures. The amount of land that we devote to actual human settlements, cities and towns, is quite small in comparison to this. Now, the massive conversion of natural habitat to agriculture has had a pronounced impact on the natural world. So in this graph, I'm showing you the decline in wildlife abundance, that is numbers of animals, uh, from the year 1970 to the present. So just in that 50 year time span, within living memory of many of you on this uh, presentation, we've seen uh, the abundance of wild animals decline by about 60%. And so this brings us to a big fundamental question. Can we feed the world? Can we provide healthy calories for the 11 billion of us who will be here by the end of the century without destroying the ecosystems upon which we depend, not only for food, but so many other ecosystem services as well? And many researchers at Imperial College are addressing this question from a wide variety of angles. But I'll be discussing the work of three of us that you were just introduced to, myself, uh, Bonnie Waring, Dr. Richard Gill, and Dr. Peter Greystock. I work on uh, the ecosystem ecology and the cycling of carbon and nutrients through ecosystems, and Rich and Peter work on pollination services. But I'll segue into this by talking about specifically the impacts that agriculture has on the environment. So it's not just land use conversion that we're worried about. The impacts of agriculture extend far beyond the boundaries of farms and into unmanaged ecosystems as well. And many of these far reaching impacts have to do with fertilizer. So if any of you are gardeners or farmers yourselves, you know that if you buy a bag of fertilizer from the supply store, you will see three numbers on the front. And those are the percentages of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, three critical nutrients that all plants need to grow. This graph here is showing the yield of oats in purple, barley in red, and wheat in green in the United Kingdom from the year 1270 when records began all the way up to the present day. And you'll notice that there is a huge increase in productivity uh, beginning around the start of the 20th century. And this is not a coincidence. During World War I, a chemical reaction was discovered, the Haber-Bosch process, that was originally developed in order to create explosives for use in the war. But as it turns out, this same process produces nitrogen fertilizer. And that was the key to this sudden rapid ramp up, what we call the green revolution in agriculture that took place in the 20th century. So most of the air we breathe is nitrogen gas. It's uh, from our perspective an almost inexhaustible resource, but plants can't use nitrogen gas to grow. In the Haber-Bosch process, nitrogen is combined with natural gas under high temperatures and pressures in the presence of an iron catalyst, and this makes ammonia that we can then directly apply to crops. Now, humans have synthesized so much fertilizer via this method that we have doubled the amount of plant usable nitrogen circulating around our planet. And here you see the growth in the uh, production of nitrogen fertilizer just over the past 60 years color coded by region of the world. So essentially, when we apply nitrogen to a farm, that nitrogen can percolate uh, into the water system, it can be volatilized back into gas and spread far beyond the ecosystems where we apply it. The situation is different for phosphorus fertilizers because unlike nitrogen, which has a gaseous component, we have to mine all of our phosphorus for fertilizer out of rock. There is some debate as to how large the world's remaining supply of rock phosphorus is. 
And by some estimates, we may hit peak phosphorus by the year 2040, which is not that far away. But one thing is for certain is that we will need to increase our reliance on phosphorus recycling because we eventually will hit a point where it becomes more and more difficult to extract this resource for use in agriculture. Now I'd like to talk in a little bit more depth about how these fertilizers impact non-target ecosystems. So when nitrogen and phosphorus get into waterways, this can lead to eutrophication. Basically, the presence of nutrients in rivers, streams, and lakes uh, fuels rapid algal growth. It leads to this green pea soup that you see sometimes. The algae grow so quickly that they use up all the oxygen in the water column, which essentially suffocates fish and all other organisms in the ecosystem. When nitrogen uh, gases get into the air, they can trigger acid rain, which caused widespread mortality in forests all throughout North America and Europe and continues to be a problem today. Finally, agriculture also affects the cycling of another key element, and that is carbon. And we care about the carbon cycle, of course, because it is central to climate change. So our planet is warming because we add CO2, carbon dioxide, to the atmosphere through our uh, human activities like burning fossil fuels. So the more carbon dioxide accumulates in the atmosphere, the warmer the planet gets. Now, carbon dioxide is constantly cycling between the atmosphere and the land, um, and carbon is also contained in the bodies of living things, plants and animals, and in the soils, which contain twice as much carbon as plants and the atmosphere combined. So in the process of photosynthesis, Trees absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and convert it into sugars, which they use to build wood and roots. And when those plants die, they fall to the ground and are decomposed by microorganisms living in the soil. In this process, some of the carbon remains below ground, and some of it is released back to the atmosphere through the breathing or respiration of decomposer microorganisms and the trees themselves. So in this way, natural processes both uh, add to and subtract from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, farming impacts the carbon cycle because management techniques that are commonly used, like tilling the soil, uh, can essentially um, stimulate the activity of decomposer microorganisms that release carbon that's been buried below ground and return it to the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. So if you are a gardener, you also know what healthy soil should look like. It should have a light, crumbly texture. And the little clods of soil that you might see in your garden are called aggregates. And they help uh, sequester carbon below ground and also um, direct the flow of water from precipitation into the soil at a steady rate so that plants can take it up. When the soil is plowed too much, it becomes degraded. It loses that health structure. Uh, you get increased water runoff and the carbon uh, has a lesser capacity to sequester carbon. So some of the work in my own laboratory is aimed at understanding how agricultural management practices impact the strength of what we call the soil carbon sink. And so this schematic here shows um, an example of an experiment we conducted in a very dry ecosystem in the Western United States. The blue line in the middle represents an irrigation system. And moving away from that irrigation on either side, we've established a gradient of soil moisture. And within each soil moisture zone, we established um, crops, uh, plots where we grew wheat, uh, either in a control treatment where we didn't add anything to the soil, or in a treatment where we amended it with compost, a form of organic fertilizer that's hypothesized to be um, uh, less damaging to the environment. And what we looked for was changes in the structure of this highly degraded and exhausted soil over the course of the growing season. On this graph here on the y-axis, I'm showing you the size of the soil aggregates, those beneficial structures that help the soil hang on to water and carbon. And the x-axis is soil moisture. So what you can see is there was a very strong relationship between the wetness of the soil over the growing season and the capacity of that soil to form aggregates. And this is actually raises uh, more questions than it answers because of course there are environmental drawbacks to irrigation as well, particularly in dry ecosystems. But in this case, we see environmental benefits related to the capacity of the soils to store carbon. What actually triggers the formation of these aggregates? Well, that has to do with the microbes that live in soil. And the image I'm showing you here 
is actually a scanning electron microscope photograph of a single grain of sand. And the long stream-like structures you see are the cells of microscopic fungi. These cells are called hyphae. They bind particles of soil together and they exude a sticky substance that feeds bacteria, which appear in this photograph as the little curly Q shaped objects. The fungi and bacteria together uh, synthesize a sticky substance called extra polysac uh, polysaccharide membrane or EPS. And this can be stabilized on the mineral surface um, and generates a form of soil carbon that is very resistant to decomposition. So in this way, the formation of aggregates through the entangling properties of those fungal hyphal cells contributes to the formation of persistent soil carbon uh, that uh, stores carbon dioxide away from the atmosphere. But these are not the only beneficial microbes that we have to thank in agricultural settings. So over 90% of plant species live in harmony with a type of beneficial fungus called mycorrhizal fungi. And there are different forms of these fungi. Some are wrapped around the outside of the plant root. Others, like the ones shown here, actually penetrate to the inside of the root cell. So in this microscope image, the stringy structures, again, are the hyphae, the cells of the fungus, inside the root of the plant. But these hyphae also extend out of the root and into the soil, where they are able to absorb phosphate in particular very efficiently. And the mycorrhizal fungus will donate this phosphorus directly to the plant host in return for some of the sugar that the plant has synthesized. So we may be able to reduce reliance on new phosphorus inputs by providing an environment that facilitates the formation of this beneficial relationship between the plant and the fungus. Another really important group of microbes is the nitrogen fixing microbes. Now, many people ask me when I talk about the invention of the Haber-Bosch process and the increase in fertilizer application, how did plants get enough nitrogen before the invention of this process? Well, it turns out that uh, bacteria, both in association with plants and free living bacteria, have the capacity to form a similar chemical reaction where atmospheric nitrogen gas is converted to a form that plants can use. If you grow any plants in the pea family, peas or beans, legumes, um, you will observe on the roots these spherical structures called nodules. And inside these nodules live bacteria that are essentially synthesizing nitrogen fertilizer for the plant. And so in many agricultural settings, farmers are exploring the use of nitrogen fixing cover crops to enhance nitrogen inputs in a chemical form that is less likely to be lost either to the groundwater or through volatilization than nitrogen fertilizer. So it's clear that we have a lot to thank microbes for uh, in terms of plant nutrition in agricultural settings. But now I'd like to talk about some other often neglected organisms that have a major role to play in our food security, and that is the insects. Now, to many of us, insects are things that we like to get rid of from our houses, but many of our most eminent biologists have repeatedly emphasized the vital role that insects play in ensuring the health of our ecosystems. Edward O. Wilson, one of the great naturalists of our time, and of course, beloved Sir David Attenborough, have both emphasized that if we carried on, uh, if the human population were going to extinct, the world would carry on, but without insects, our civilization could not endure. And one of the most uh, important services that insects perform for us is pollination. So almost all wild plants depend on pollinators in, uh, in order to propagate, but we also require help from insects to pollinate crop flowers as well. And so these images uh, show bees on wildflowers in the Arctic and in an agroecosystem. So the importance of pollinators cannot be overstated. Of the 115 leading crops across the globe, 87 of them rely on insect pollinators for production. And this service contributes over 150 billion euros to the crop industry every single year. And in this figure, you could see the benefits of pollinators uh, with uh, more reliance on their services in areas of the globe shown in red. To visualize this importance another way, the image on the right shows a typical grocery store that you might stroll through on any day of the week. 
The image on the left shows the same grocery store removing all of the fruits and vegetables that we rely on insect pollinators um, to help propagate. So you can see that your choice would be far more restricted if we did not have the services of these insects. What the image doesn't show is that the meat and dairy counters would also be impacted if pollinators were to disappear because the plants that cows and sheep eat also rely on insect pollination. However, we're facing a huge challenge uh, with relevance to pollinator ecosystem services. At the same time as food demand has increased due to the rising population of humans, the populations of pollinating insects have declined quite steeply. And this leads to what we call a pollination deficit. We're facing a situation where we may not have enough pollinating insects to deliver the crop yields that we require to feed the world. The reasons for pollinator decline are very complex. And to understand them, we need to uh, look across multiple different levels of biological organization, understanding genetic responses within individual pollinator communities, understanding changes in the individual behavior of pollinating insects in response to environmental stressors, looking at the population dynamics of these organisms and even their interactions with members of the broader ecological community. And work at Imperial is spanning all of these levels of biological organization to tackle the pollinator crisis. And so I'll be sharing some of the work of Dr. Richard Gill and Dr. Peter Greystock here at Imperial. And both of them, of course, will be joining me to answer your questions right after this presentation. So recently work in the Gill lab has fo uh, focused on the role of genetic changes in bees in response to a common type of stressor that they experience in agroecosystems, which is exposure to pesticides. And what Dr. Gill's group has found is that pesticides appear to affect the activity of genes that are involved in mitochondrial activity. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of B cells. It's what generates energy. And changes in these mitochondrial genes led the group to hypothesize that potentially bees exposed to pesticides have less stamina. They are not as able to travel as far around the landscape. And to test this idea in the Gill lab, bees were exposed uh, to pesticides at realistic concentrations. And then they were put through their paces on a custom built flight mill to measure how far they could move. Bees that were not exposed to pesticides were able to travel about 1.8 kilometers, which is pretty impressive for an insect smaller than your thumb. But those bees that had been exposed could only travel about two thirds of a kilometer. So this is a dramatic reduction in their capacity to forage. Now we want to understand not only why pollinators are declining today, but also what's triggered past declines. So the Gill Lab is also using ancient DNA methodologies, the same thing that we use to study ancient human populations or woolly mammoths, to look for changes in the um, structure and um, genetic material of bees in museum collections. Some of these specimens are up to 150 years old. And Dr. Gill's group is also combining um, this ancient DNA technology with visualization technology, similar to what you get when you go to a hospital for a CT scan, to look at changes in the morphology of the bees and also the structures of their brains. And what they have found is that unfortunately, bees exposed to pesticides have smaller brains and those shrinkages in brain volume correspond to decreases in their abilities on learning tasks that are directly related to pollination behavior in the field. And to follow this research through, Dr. Gill and his group attached individual microchips to foraging bees and then followed them as they moved through a network of flowers, both in the laboratory and in the field. The bar graph uh, shown in the lower left shows the amount of pollen bees were able to capture. So the bees that were exposed to the pesticide captured less pollen. The black dots show uh, how long the bees had to forage to bring home this pollen, and they foraged longer in the exposed group. So basically, pesticide exposure reduces the bang for buck bees get um, when they're going out to forage. They get less pollen for greater effort. Now, when bees are foraging through a landscape, they're not only encountering the pollen itself, 
They may also encounter pesticides, toxins, and parasites as they travel from flower to flower. And Dr. Peter Greystock's work has focused extensively on how bees cope with this type of stress as they navigate through the landscape. Many bees are exposed to high concentrations of heavy metals as they forage for nectar and pollen. You might ask why this is so. These soils across the country are enriched in heavy metals like cadmium, selenium, and copper, sometimes as a natural function of the composition of the soil, other times as a remnant of industrial pollution. Plants can mobilize these heavy metals and they can be in high concentrations in the plant tissues, um, up to 15,000 parts per million for selenium, for instance. And unfortunately, the bees have no mechanism to sense or taste the high heavy metal concentrations in the flowers they're foraging from. So this led Dr. Greystock to ask whether bee mortality could be driven by some of their exposure to these heavy metals. And to answer this question, bees were exposed to increasing concentrations of three heavy metals. In the three graphs at right, moving from left to right, we're showing an increase in the quantity of heavy metal supplied to the bee. On the y-axis, I'm showing you survival of the bees. And so for each heavy metal, there was a threshold beyond which the bees could not survive if they had been exposed. What can help the bees protect themselves from these threats? Well, one thing we know is that the uh, bacteria that live inside the guts of the bees are extremely important in their general health and condition, just as is true for us. A healthy bee can have over a, a billion bacterial cells in the gut. And Dr. Greystack has shown that some of these bacteria have genes that appear to confer resistance to heavy metal stress. So to test this idea, Dr. Greystock reared bees with and without exposure to their beneficial bacteria. So some of the bees were completely sterile. And then these bees were subjected to toxins. And the bees that had a healthy bacterial community were far better able to tolerate the toxin exposure. So what this suggests, just like we need bee suits to handle uh, working with the colonies if you're a beekeeper, the bees themselves have a protective suit that is the colonies of beneficial bacteria in their guts, which uh, form a line of defense as they're encountering toxins in the wild. Now, much of the work that I have just discussed is focusing on honeybees and bumblebees. And in fact, around 90% of bee research is focused on those groups. And 60% of all bee research is focused on just three species of bees when there are over 20,000 bee species in the world. So what about all the rest of these bees? Are they important? To address this question, Dr. Greystock and his group tracked 5,000 bees and flowers at multiple sites over a five month period. And their goal here was to assess whether the species of bees that are most commonly employed in agricultural settings depend on the health of the wider bee and flower community. And what they found is that the incidence of disease that the bees were exposed to was lower when there was a higher diversity of bee species in the environment. Similarly, disease prevalence was lower within the bee populations when there was a greater abundance of flowers. And why should this be so? Well, bees are pretty messy eaters. Uh, this photograph here shows a bee covered in pollen. Bees, unfortunately, also poop where they eat. So uh, experiments with fluorescent dye have shown that bees can defecate on the flowers they visit. And in that way, flowers can serve as hubs of bee disease. As it turns out, flowers differ in many traits that affect their likelihood of being visited by a bee. Um, and so a wider variety and more numerous flowers in the landscape reduce the concentration of bee pathogens within individual flower hubs. So what does this research tell us as a whole? Agricultural landscapes are simplifying. Instead of small scale farms that grow a variety of crops and may also be intermixed with livestock, we have large homogenous fields. And this is probably having an impact on the health of pollinator populations. So what we'd like to see is farming practices that encourage bee diversity because the bees most important for pollination are healthier if the whole bee community is more diverse. We'd like to see a larger diversity of flowers and a larger number of flowers to dilute the spread of diseases. <laughs>
So I hope that uh, some of the examples that I've given you of research going on at Imperial have given you a uh, greater appreciation for the tiny and often neglected organisms that are so important to the health of the human community. And with that, I'd like to uh, open up the Q&A panel for discussion, and I really look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Bonnie, that was a, a really great talk, and uh, really thanks for doing such a good, good job of, of covering uh, Peter's and myself's work as well. So brilliant talk. So we'll we'll have a look at the um, at the Q and A uh, and try and address and answer as many of the questions as we possibly can. Um, let me just click on this. Oh, hold on. Sorry, I'm having a few technical problems uh, coming through now. Um, so my apologies. We'll go through as many of the questions as possible um, and. Apologies if we can't um, answer them all and we and we miss any. Um, let's have a look. So a general question probably to all three of us. Will we be able to bring organisms back if they if they've become extinct very recently or maybe um, organisms that have been extinct for a long time? Uh, tough question, I think. Uh, I'll give it to Peter. Sure. Um, so yeah, it, it is a tricky question, and I think um, in many ways we can think of Jurassic Park. You know, they could bring uh, dinosaurs back, but should they have? And I think in many cases, if we can bring an animal back, we need to first consider why it went extinct, because there's no point bringing something back if the stresses which caused it to go extinct are still there. Because what would happen then? Is that you'd spend a lot of money um, bringing this back from extinction, reintroducing it into an area, uh, and that may well be uh, unsuccessful. And it may be much better to spend the money um, which you would spend bringing an animal back, instead spend it to try and protect what you still have there. Um, and so I think that's maybe the bigger question is, should we bring them back if we're still causing the problems which are creating these extinctions in the first place? Uh, perhaps Bonnie, do you, do you want to add to that or are you, do you agree? Yeah, I think Peter makes an excellent point. Um, so the technology to sort of bring back or resuscitate a species is quite uncertain, but what's not uncertain is the cause of species decline. So we know that habitat loss is leading to extinctions. We know that pollution is leading to extinctions. We know that invasive species and increasingly climate change are leading to it. So I agree, it's those root causes we have to address. That's great. Um, I think I would also like to add that there are two, almost two types of extinction. You can have localised extinction, so that's what you, where you might become extinct, for example, in a particular area, geographic region or country, and there can also be obviously a worldwide extinction. And they might have a slightly different answer depending on whether they're localised or completely worldwide extinct. Um, next question. What can practically be done to protect insect populations? Um, oh, got some, <laughs> got a fire alarm. Um, well, I'll, I I'll think I'll give that to to Pete. Uh, it's, it's, sorry, what was the question again? Sorry. Uh, what can practically be done to protect insect populations? Uh, so, uh, like some of the results, just um, um, Bonnie were just talking about. It's, it's about protecting habitat and trying to protect um, diversity of, of insects. I think often we focus on the insects which are, you know, beneficial to us or can make money, whereas sometimes um, we really should be focusing on the more rarer species to try and help have diversity and help have a, a buffer against if we lose particular species uh, that have a function then if we have enough diversity, we can keep those functions there. So really um, maintaining and trying to improve wild habitats uh, is, a, is a really important thing to do um, and trying to not necessarily introduce um, too many exotic or managed animals into an area, but trying instead promote the wild, um, wild environment and wild animals in those areas. 
Yeah, I think and that's a great answer. I think I would I would add that I think it's just key for us to understand that when when we change the environment, when we um, when we do things like adding pesticides to the to the any kind of toxic chemicals, we have to realise that it will always have a consequence. Um, you know, insecticides, for example, the the you know the cute that sort of hinted in the name, it does kill insects. It's designed to do that. Um, and we can't just overlook the fact that by applying them, there's just some magic bullet to be able to still apply them, but it not have an effect. We just have to use them very responsibly. I'm certainly not an advocate of banning insecticides, um, but I think we, we do have a responsibility to make sure that we use them both more effectively, but also understand things like the insect life histories so that we can apply them at times where insects are less likely to be exposed to them. And so that ultimately um, lowers the risk. I mean, that's just a, you know an insecticide case, but we also must understand how we can manage the landscapes better to support populations. But that also means we have to have a good understanding about um, the spatial, what we call heterogeneity of the landscape, how we should actually compartmentalise the landscape to both support pollinators, but also to grow our crops. Um, Bonnie, would you like to add to it? It was quite an insect specific question. As, as you may have noticed, I was dealing with a fire alarm in my building, so I'll go along for the next one. OK. <laughs> um, so uh, I've recently heard about the Ethiopian crop um, onset, the false banana. Given it is such a useful crop and seems to cope with climate change, how do you think changing people's attitudes to novel food sources um, can be can benefit and 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 allow us to grow more climate resistant crops? So I guess this is um, there might be more climate resistant crops out there, but people might not necessarily want to to eat them or they're not their favourite food. Do we need to change a, a, an attitude there, or or is there other issues? Uh, Bonnie, I think there's always a slight lag, so you just have to wait five seconds to answer. Well, hopefully I can be heard now. Yeah. So the effect of uh, our diet on environmental problems is actually quite profound. Um, and the biggest contributor to uh, the pressure we're putting on the environment is the amount of meat in our diets. Um, so as I showed in my talk, we're using 50% of the habitable land on the planet to produce crops, but 70% of that area is for meat. It's for livestock. So um, there are many factors of our dietary choices that can influence the environment, but probably the most straightforward relationship between the health of the environment and our diets is how much meat and dairy we choose to eat. Um. Quite a general question, but it might be interesting for any budding young uh, or, or old scientists out there. How how did we get into this field? Um, so a general question, how, how, why are we so interested in the research that we're doing? So I'll pass that to to Pete first and then and then over to Bonnie. Sure. Um, so I actually I actually got into to this field quite late. I um, up to my mid 20s, I was um, in IT. Um, and then I, I realised that I, I really enjoyed working with with animals, uh, and so took a took a zoology degree, um, and then just became uh, you know in in love with um, social insects and the complexity and the um, the, the the ability to um, have these social behaviours and things, uh, and so from that I just continued in, in academia. But um, I absolutely didn't set out that you know that way. And when I started my zoology degree, I I didn't realise that I was insect interested in insects I you know I, I was imagining myself hugging koalas somewhere uh, and doing these exciting things um, and then I realized that actually my excitement is just as much in a, a mound of dirt with ants um, as it is um, looking in beehives and things. Bonnie. All right so, so um I actually don't spend most of my time working in agroecosystems. A lot of my research concerns tropical forests. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I was really privileged to be able to study abroad in Central America. 
And although I had spent my entire life loving nature and loving the outdoors, it had never occurred to me that you could make a career studying nature. And on that program was the first time I encountered a community of research ecologists uh, who spend their time trying to unravel some of the solutions to the major environmental challenges we face, like many we've talked about today. Um, so if any younger people are watching and you like biology, but you don't want to go to medical school, there is a whole other array of career options open to you in the uh, life sciences research world. And we actually need a lot more bright people of all ages to sort of join us on these research programs because there are many more questions than we're able to address. Okay, back to me. And and my, my mine's simple. I love David Attenborough. <laughs> I love nature. I, I was probably a bit more into uh, into birding, into twitching when I was younger. But I just a bit like Peter. I found the wonderful world of insects, and they they're just amazing, and they're so important. And um, I was just a, a why person. Always went into my garden and asked why does this happen, and that drove me to become uh, an academic in biology. And, and going from there now, I'm just very, uh, I'm concerned to some degree about making sure that we can have a sustainable planet. And, and for me, protecting insects is a key part uh, to contributing to that. Right, uh, just a quick question here. Uh, if you have a garden and you grow native weeds like dandelions and white clover, um, are they beneficial to pollinators via pollen? Um, I think I can, maybe even Pete could do it better, but I think I can answer that. Firstly, there's a lot of flowering wheat that you call weeds that are fantastic for pollinators. If you have your garden and you don't mow it and you let it, you allow white and red clover to grow, it's a very, very nice uh, nectar source mainly for, for bees and other insect pollinators, although they will collect pollen from them. Dandelions are a little bit more pollen heavy. They'll get more pollen from those. Only issue with those is they're a, a bit more specific to the pollinator that visits them. It's normally a few species of solitary bee and um, and honeybees. Bumblebees tend to go on, on them a little bit less, but the bumblebees love the clover. Would you say, nod your head, Peter, if you think that that was a good answer? OK, good. Um, so I think this is. Uh, Bonnie, this is to you. Can intensive agriculture and regenerative regenerative management of soils go hand in hand? Probably a tough question. Uh, intensive agriculture and healthy soils, was it? Uh, sorry, come back to me. Just wait for me to go live. Uh, can can intensive agriculture and coupled with regenerative management of soils so i don't know whether that means set aside or whether there's some other type of regeneration of soils that can go can those two things go hand in hand or is one just more unsustainable than the other and you it's it's we're, it doesn't matter what we do we we're, we're leading to a, a problem with keeping the nutrients within those landscapes Yeah, so um, the ways that in which we modify soil environments in agriculture have a huge impact on sustainability. Um, the problem is that the research onto the effects of soil management and um, uh, basically the strength of um, the capacity of those soils to draw down carbon from the atmosphere is really in its infancy. Um, so a lot of research has suggested that, for instance, reduced tillage of crops can increase the amount of carbon sequestered in the topsoil. What we're beginning to realize is that the amount of carbon in deeper soil layers can actually decline when we reduce tillage because there's less burial of the residues from the plants. So we really need to take a step back and look at the whole soil system from the very top uh, to the bottom of the soil depth to understand what the carbon impacts of different management practices are. In terms of soil health, we know that more diverse microbial communities are better for the health of the plants and other organisms in those systems. And that involves reduction of uh, reliance on pesticides and herbicides. Uh, 
So there's a question here. I probably don't know the answer to, but there's there's two thumbs up, so I should ask it. Uh, I wonder if human mitochondria is also affected by people eating foods containing pesticides. Um, my response to that is um, possibly, uh, but I, <laughs> I, I I don't know. Um, however, many of these pesticides have been, um, you know, developed and and trialed and tested to really uh, focus on the kind of cellular receptors of insects as well as other other types of pests so when it comes to their toxicity to humans it is much much lower so whether it affects some things like mitochondrial genes that i it, it it possibly could do if it was in very very high amounts but the amounts that you're probably getting in your food for example are extremely low and so i don't think that would be the case. Um, if you were to be exposed to those pesticides in a farming environment, especially if um, the regulations in certain countries might not be quite as tight as others, then maybe. Um, but I, I think I should just really say that I don't know the, the answer to that question. Pete, would you add anything to that or or not? Um, no, I, I, I think it's right. You know, the, these pesticides aren't developed necessarily to uh, be harmful to humans and uh, directly um, so as, as long as as long as everything is like purchased um, uh, properly and through the UK or EU or whatever I, the standard should be that they're um, they, they won't be toxic to humans in in normal quantities and just to say that the the, the, the regulations are very strict and that the pesticide companies invest a lot of money um, into making sure that they conduct a number of trials and, and they have a number of different um, uh, kind of assays that they actually conduct to look at whether it affects um, mammals so you know things like rodents and and it can only get passed and licensed if it's shown that it's below any kind of um, major risk um, Uh, oh, there's a, quite quite a, another general question here. Um, will a vegetarian diet help at all? Um, I think maybe Bonnie's the best to to first answer that, if that's okay. Yes. So absolutely, environment um, the environmental effects of diet are large, and reducing one's reliance on meat and dairy can certainly help. Um, I think it's important to emphasize that any reduction counts and matters. Uh, you don't have to be fully vegetarian or vegan. And the reason for this is that it takes far more resources to produce a single calorie of beef than it does a single calorie of soy, for instance. Um, so more resources in terms of land area, more resources in terms of water, more resources in terms of uh, other inputs like fertilizers. Uh, there's a misconception for instance, that large-scale deforestation in the Amazon is driven by an increased um, demand for soy. That is true, but the soy is used to feed beef cattle. It's not used to feed people. And it's just a fundamental law of thermodynamics that every time one organism eats another, some energy is lost. So by eating lower on the food chain, we reduce the overall energy requirements of our diets globally. So reducing the amount of meat in your diet can definitely have a large impact on all of the environmental challenges posed by agriculture. I think my, I would only add to that. I mean, I, I eat meat, but I have tried to cut down, especially on red meat and I um, or eat uh, white meat because of the inputs that, that Bonnie's been talking about. Um, but it, it probably is a very complex topic where ecologically, yes, eating um, less meat is certainly has its benefits, um, but of course there are economic implications there for people having to change or alter the way they might farm the land, for example. So, um, yeah, a, 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 a tough, tough situation to 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 talk about. Um, if we roll back the chemicals used in agriculture and the monoculture of farms, how much agricultural yield is lost to feed the planet? Oof. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll I'll let 
uh, maybe Bonnie could talk about the the loss of yields, and then we maybe me and Pete could talk a little bit about the trade offs between protecting pollinators versus loss of yield. Uh, so I'll, I'll push over to Bonnie first. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. So there is a constant tension between what we call agricultural extensification, converting more land to agriculture, and agricultural intensification, which is getting more unit of crops out of the same patch of land. Now, one of the reasons why it's difficult to talk about the environmental impacts of dietary changes is because there are few win-win-win scenarios. So for instance, in organic agriculture, it's very true that this reduces inputs of pesticides, which is unambiguously a good thing. But to date, very, very few, if any, organic uh, agricultural systems have the same yield as conventional ones, which means that if we need to feed ever more people and we convert fully to organic systems as they now exist, we would need more land to support the same yield. So what we really need to do is focus our energies on reducing the environmental impact of agriculture through a two-pronged approach, figure out how to reduce synthetic fertilizer and chemical inputs, but still maintain high yields so that we don't need to keep converting land into agriculture. And, and over to, to Pete, please. Uh, yeah, and so if we, if we removed like the large fields and have smaller fields um, so that you can have more hedgerows and things that would increase uh, pollinator diversity and um, reduce the reliance on honeybees. Um, honeybees are often utilized on these large fields because wild bees can't travel from their homes and the, the hedgerows and things all the way into the center. Um, whereas if we reduced our reliance on these huge fields, we'd be able to um, utilize more um, the wild, uh, wild pollinators, which would um, which would be great, and it would uh, reduce the cost of of uh, pollinating those fields as well, so we wouldn't be having to um, have these um, hives in those areas too. Yeah, and and there's also been quite a long-standing um, kind of discussion about our reliance on on insect, you know, pesticides as well as insecticides. Um, and the uh, the kind of strategy of what's called um, integrated pest management, so a kind of almost biological control using some of the natural world to keep your pe uh, pest species down. So, some, for example, in many of the habitats that surround um, certain uh, fields, you can have what's called natural enemies. So these might be wasps and other, um, other types of organisms that might come in and actually eat some of the pests on those crops. But of course, if you spray pesticides, you can potentially disrupt that um, food chain and you're actually killing some of those natural enemies whilst keeping your, your uh, uh, crop pest down. The problem is that if you keep using your pesticide too much, that crop pest that has a much higher reproductive rate starts to become resistant because you get mutations and they come to what's called fixation in the population. So you're always trying to uh, develop new pesticides to overcome some of that um, resistance and there's the big question of well is that just becoming unsustainable and should we be relying on the, the natural world to come some, keep some of these populations down. Now that's difficult if you have very very large fields where the natural enemies can't reach inside of that field to keep the pest down like Peter was saying so it's a it's a difficult challenge. Um, could you tell us more about the ancient DNA project undertaken in collaboration with Natural History Museum? OK, so very quickly. Yep. Yeah, um, so the Bonnie discussed about the ancient DNA project uh, using bumblebees from multiple uh, museums. We are collaborating with someone, Professor Ian Barnes, who's at the Natural History Museum, along with Selena Brace and Victoria Mullen. Um, and we basically are using these ancient DNA tools that were used for uh, looking at things like woolly mammoth, for example, to be able to extract tiny amounts of DNA from the legs of these museum specimens that are maybe 150 years old. And we can start to reconstruct parts of their genome. And by doing that, we can actually look at how well the population did at specific times in the past 100, 150 years. And we can do that by looking at signatures in the genome to see whether there's been loss or gain 
of diversity and you would expect to see loss of diversity if certain changes in land use or climate change have had big impacts on their population sizes. Um, and one of the big questions has been that we, we Im implicate a lot of these stress factors in causing population declines, but actually hard evidence to show um, whether they really caused some of these declines is, is still missing. And we're trying to look into the genomes because the, um, in many ways, if you find those signatures, the genome doesn't lie. OK, um, I think we're getting a bit close to the end of time now. Let me just um, check. I apologize. OK, so I'm going to ask the final question and then we will have to uh, wrap it up. Let's just find. Uh, maybe, uh, here's, here's one that's got two thumbs up. Um, you were talking about flying pollinators, but are there any significant crawling pollinators that we should be encouraging? Pete, do you think you could ask answer that one? I, I can give it a go. So um, we don't know as much about crawling pollinators as we do about uh, the flying ones. Um, in terms of keeping like the diversity of insects in general, um, some of the main things that we can do are, um, um, oh, sorry, you weren't asking what we could do, you were just asking if there are some. Um, sorry, yes, there are. Um, and if you if you look on like dandelions is a great, um, a great flower to look at. Often you'll see lots of um, like little frips in there, maybe ants and things like that. Uh, there are lots of insects which um, can, which certainly which benefit from um, flowers and can pollinate them. They're often not the ideal pollinator. Uh, so they won't pollinate as well as uh, as bees and things, um, but certainly there's uh, there's there's a lot of a lot of other pollinators uh, around, uh, many of which don't have wings. Yep, yeah, so that comes back to me. Um, yeah, I think um, Peter there highlighted thrips. I mean, these are, are definitely massively understudied. They're very very small organisms, small insects, but it seems that you know you find them in a lot of flowers, so they probably are quite important, a, cer a certain degree of pollination. And um, beetles, I mean, they they do they can fly, um, but they do generally crawl around, and they're also very important um, pollinators. I mean, I've I've been to South Africa where beetles are particularly important for pollination there, um, both for crops and and wildflowers. Okay, so I'm 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 really sorry if we didn't manage to address. Uh, a question that you left. I'm afraid we're out of time. Really hope you enjoyed that that scientific breaks. Um, I'd like to give a, a clap to both uh, Peter and, and Bonnie um, for doing such a great job. And um, and we we really hope that you can you're able to join another event as part of this um, science break series. And it just should come up on the screen now for you when the next one is engineering chocolate. That sounds I think I might be watching that. That's already making me hungry. Uh, Tuesday, 1st of December at, at 12, at 12.30. And um, I'll say bye to you all and, and, and thanks very much for joining.